All right, well, good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of our chairman, Charles Ramsey, and our executive director, Mike Pennington, thank you so much for joining today's virtual orientation session for applicants and prospective grantees for the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquencies 2021 Violence Intervention and Prevention Grants Program. Uh, my name is Sam Cook, and I serve as a senior project manager within the executive offices here at PCCD. And I'm also joined today by several other PCCD team members who will be supporting today's webinar, including members of our executive program and fiscal staff. So first up, just a few housekeeping rules and a couple reminders. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with participants uh, via email as soon as it becomes available. We do encourage you to check your audio settings to make sure you're able to hear today's presentation using your computer or other device. Um, just a quick note that we cannot hear you. Um, however, you will be able to submit questions through the Q&A feature in the live event. Um, questions submitted through this feature will not be immediately visible to all of our participants. However, uh, please be rest assured that they will be reviewed and received by PCCD staff as they come in. Uh, we have allotted 15 to 20 minutes at the end of our webinar today to answer any questions that have come through uh, that Q&A feature. And to the extent possible, any questions we're not able to fully address in today's webinar will be answered through follow-up communications and guidance uh, via email or other methods. Uh, and last but not least, a copy of today's PowerPoint slides will also be emailed out to participants um, for reference um, moving forward. So feel free to not uh, scribble furiously in terms of note taking. Uh, moving towards the rest of our agenda, uh, we will provide a brief overview of PCCD, including the agency's mission and programs. Uh, then we'll provide an overview of the 2021 Violence Intervention and Prevention, or uh, VIP, grants funding announcement. Uh, then I'll turn things over to my colleague, Heather Hewitt, who will be providing an overview of PCCD's e-grant system, which will be used to develop and submit your organization's formal application for funding. This overview will include important information about the registration process for individual users, um, as well as organizations and agencies, among other components. I'll then pass things over to my colleague, Chris, to talk a little bit about uh, the vendor registration process that the Commonwealth has, which is important, especially if this is uh, one of your first times getting a state grant. Um, and then we'll uh, turn things back over to me to do a review of application next steps, including um, a summary of some uh, action steps, the application itself in eGrants, um, as well as some application homework for organizations that are um, approved in our first round for funding. Um, and we'll also cover kind of a, an overview of the expenses that are and are not allowed um, under the 2021 VIP grant program as a refresher. And finally, as we noted before, we will be reserving 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer any questions that you have that have been submitted uh, using the Q&A feature of the Teams Live webinar platform. Um, so with that roadmap ahead of us, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, first, a little bit about PCCD. Uh, for those of you who may be less familiar with our agency, we wanted to provide a quick overview of the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Our agency was established in 1978 through Pennsylvania state law and serves as the Commonwealth's justice planning and policy making agency. Uh, our agency's mission is to enhance the quality, coordination, and planning within the criminal and juvenile justice systems. Uh, to facilitate the delivery of services to victims of crime and to increase the safety of our communities. We are a relatively small state agency housed within the executive office with approximately 100 employees working across four offices and underlying units uh, who facilitate the work of six advisory committees, the School Safety and Security Committee, and two training boards, as well as implement the actions taken by the Commission. Uh, as you can see on this slide, PCCD's responsibilities and programs fall into a number of different areas, including funding and grants, technical assistance, data and research, victims compensation and training, um, among other responsibilities. Uh, we also administer a number of state and federal funding streams and provide uh, grants supporting best practices and innovation at the state and local levels. Uh, these are mainly focused on criminal and juvenile justice and related systems, victim services, prevention, and public safety. In recent years, PCCD has also administered state funding streams focused on school safety and security, as well as the nonprofit security grant program as additional examples. 
Uh, we also provide technical assistance for a variety of programs and initiatives. Um, our agency uh, is also responsible for uh, providing statewide statistical and analytical services for criminal justice and public safety data, uh, producing resources such as digital dashboards, gathering information through statewide surveys, uh, such as the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, uh, among other examples. The agency is specifically tasked with providing services to victims of crime and is responsible for the administration of the state's Crime Victims Compensation Fund, as well as child advocacy centers. And PCCD is also responsible for coordinating training for sheriffs, deputy sheriffs uh, and constables, county probation officers, as well as other justice related stakeholders. We would, of course, welcome you to learn more about PCCD and our programs, resources, and initiatives by visiting our website, which is located at pccd.pa.gov. And I'd also encourage folks to take a look at our agency's strategic framework, um, which covers the agency's overarching goals and priorities for 2021 through 2025. So uh, moving from our agency overview into um, a little bit on the 2021 VIP grant program. Um, on June 30th, the state budget allocated $30 million to PCCD for Violence Intervention and Prevention, or VIP. Uh, in response to these new resources, our staff and members of the School Safety and Security Committee, which is responsible for administering these funds, uh, developed and adopted a VIP funding plan that utilized a multi-prong approach to the administration of those new dollars. Um, so the plan involved using a portion of VIP funds to immediately supplement and support additional applications received through our 2021 Gun Violence Reduction Grant Program, which was announced earlier this spring, as well as to augment current existing gun violence reduction grantees whose programs had demonstrated promise and early success. The remaining 24 million, um, as you all are familiar with, was slated to be distributed as grants or technical assistance through a new VIP funding announcement that was released on September 3rd of this year. Um, so as noted on this slide, the primary purpose of VIP funding is intended to support effective local intervening and preventive measures to stop gun and group violence. Uh, in communities experiencing high rates of violent crime across the Commonwealth. On December 1st, uh, so just a, a week or two ago, uh, the School Safety and Security Committee approved a first round of 40 VIP projects totaling up to $15.7 million. Um, so our uh, congratulations to all of you who are on this call today um, for uh, the approval of your, your projects and for making it to the next step in this funding process. Um, so applicants who were selected in that initial round of requests are now being asked to complete a formal application in eGrants. In addition to today's orientation session and training, um, just know that PCCD staff will also be available um, on an ongoing basis to provide technical support to organizations with the formal eGrants application process us and to answer any questions that you may have uh, as you get started in this next phase. So before we dive into the e-grant system and the application process, we did want to provide a quick refresher on the VIP funding announcement. Um, so as you can see on this slide, uh, eligible applicants were identified in fiscal code language and included community-based organizations and nonprofits, institutions of higher education, municipalities, counties, and district attorney's offices. Eligible applicants could request their maximum budget amount, depending on their eligible category, between $50,000 and $2 million to support project activities over a two-year project period. Uh, there was no match requirement, and PCCD did reserve the right and does reserve the right to determine final budgets as part of the final application process. So in addition to those broad eligibility categories, um, grants and technical assistance supported with VIP funds were to align with the list of eligible activities designed to reduce community violence that were included in section 1306B, subsection J, uh, sub, subsection 22 of the public school code. In addition, uh, this, the VIP work group endorsed additional models and approaches that were aligned with those eligible activities, uh, supporting the grant program's overall goal of reducing gun and group violence in the Commonwealth, um, which you can see listed here on that slide. So that includes street outreach and violence interruption programs, uh, safe passages and safe corridors, wraparound supports and services for individuals most likely to be involved with um, uh, violence, hospital-based and hospital-linked violence intervention programs, uh, programs focused on pre-release and re-entry supports, 
uh, trauma-informed approaches and, and really any other uh, promising violence intervention uh, or prevention strategy aligned with the program's goals. Um, so as you uh, may recall in your initial funding request in SurveyMonkey, you were asked uh, what model type most closely aligns with your project description. Um, and we recognize that for many of the projects that are being recommended to move forward, um, it may not neatly fit into one particular category, but um, overall uh, projects that are funded fit into these broad areas. So I um, wanted to provide a little bit of an overview before I pass things off to my colleague Heather, who will um, do a really great job uh, walking you all through uh, the system we know and love to be e-grants. Uh, just provide an overview of kind of where we are in process in terms of the overall funding timeline and next steps. So um, as we mentioned before, the initial funding request period uh, is, is behind us. That started on September 3rd when the SurveyMonkey a uh, link opened up. We held a webinar for prospective applicants and the deadline for that funding request was October 15th. Um, during the month of October and November, we worked to review all of the applications that were submitted through that initial funding request period. Um, we had a VIP work group review and approve a set of initial round one VIP recommended projects. Again, um, what, what each of you um, proposed as part of your organization. Um, and then finally, those recommendations were sent over to the School Safety and Security Committee for their review and approval uh, on December 1st. So you can see in that next box, the, the darkly shaded box, um, we are now entering the formal e-grants application and orientation process for our round one VIP project. So uh, the eGrants application did officially open on December 1st. Um, each of you should have received an email notification uh, with information about uh, that eGrants application, how to access it, and a copy of the funding announcement. Uh, the eGrants application window will close on Wednesday, December 22nd. Um, at 11.59 p.m. Um, so we're asking folks to, to do their best to submit applications within that window. Um, we're obviously holding our virtual orientation session today, which is December 7th. And as I mentioned before, uh, we're of course available to provide any support and assistance that you might need uh, as you navigate the eGrant system um, and, and sort of uh, submit your, your formal applications. Um, once the applications are submitted after December 22nd or sooner, um, we will be uh, reviewing those formal applications um, between December and January. Um, and our plan is to host some, in in some initial, excuse me, onboarding meetings with program and fiscal staff who will be assigned to your projects. Um, after we've had a chance to review and finalize those applications and move you guys closer to uh, hopefully an award stage uh, by the end of January, early February. So more information to come on that. And then last but certainly not least, after um, everything's been finalized, the project period for awards, just as a reminder, um, was January 1, 2022 through December 31st, 2023, so a two-year period. Um, and that means that the first quarterly program and fiscal reports for this uh, grant program will be due from subgrantees uh, in April of 2022. So um, in addition to that kind of timeline, um, just a couple additional things to note. Um, final recommendation of projects will be made following the receipt and review of applications in eGrants. Uh, and just to note that PCCD may require some programmatic modifications from what was proposed in the initial request. Uh, and we do reserve the right, as I mentioned before, to make final budget determinations and modifications as part of this process. Um, and worth noting as well, obviously, um, your projects uh, received conditional approval and recommendation by the School Safety and Security Committee uh, on December 1st. Um, however, an invitation to submit an application in eGrants does not 100% guarantee that an applicant will be funded. Um, so we're, we're using this as a way to gather additional information about your proposed projects, make sure that we understand what grant funds will be used for, um, and so we may be asking you for additional information um, after you submit that application just to really uh, figure out and finalize what, what funds will be used to support. Um, so back and forth is normal, um, especially if you're new to eGrants and, and Heather and Chris will uh, probably share a little bit more about this. Um, it's, it's totally normal to get a ton of pending assignment reminders um, and system notifications as well as communications from, from PCCD staff. And we just ask that you be as responsive as you can be uh, to help us kind of get the information we need to move things along. 
Um, I just wanted to also note that grant recipients, as we mentioned before, will be required to submit financial reports in our e-grant system. Um, and we do use a reimbursement model for reported and eligible expenditures. So we do understand that all grantees may not have enough cash on hand uh, to be able to purchase more expensive items or services on a reimbursement basis. So um, if you fit into that category, uh, let us know and we can certainly work with grantees in those situations to provide funding in a timely manner. Um, and in addition, we plan to hold meetings with grantees, um, those onboarding calls uh, to sort of walk them through next steps as we move into the award and implementation phase of the project. Um, so again, we're here to help. We know that this is a newer process for many of you, um, and it's not always the easiest one to navigate. So if you ever have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out. And so now uh, I am pleased to pass things over to my uh, colleague, Heather Hewitt, who will be walking you all through um, our e-grant system and the registration process. So Heather, you wanna take it away? Yep. Thanks, Sam. Good morning, everybody. Uh, if you wanna go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the first step in the e-grants registration process is to complete an agency registration form. And there is a link on this slide that will take you to that. Agencies must be properly registered in e-grants if they intend to apply for a grant. And uh, this slide does include the information um, as far as who's eligible to sign and then where you can send your completed form to. Next slide. Thank you. Once your agency is registered, individual users must register and each individual, each user must have their own account. Um, and there are a few different types of users as listed on this slide. So there will be, a, some of you may already have an eGrant um, user login. Um, so you'll either be existing an existing user or you're going to be a new eGrants user. Um, and these are all based on your Keystone login, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, but these are the four different scenarios that um, you would fall into for registration. Next slide. And a step-by-step -step guide to this process is on our website. If you follow the um, the links here, um, they will walk you through every step of the, the process. Next slide. Once you are registered as an eGrants user, you're going to complete the new user role request form. This form establishes the roles necessary for you to access your grant. And uh, again, the, the link to this form is included on the slide and you can return your completed form to the resource account that's listed. Next slide. For users, there are six unique roles which are listed here. Um, they are the financial creator, the financial reader, program creator, program reader, submission, and user manager. <coughs> just to note, reader roles are just like a read-only document. You're able to look at the content, but you are not able to make any changes to it. The creator roles um, do have the ability to go in and create the content that is in your application. The submission role can submit grant forms like applications, modifications, and continuations. Without this role, you are unable, to, you can still create the content or view the content, but you cannot submit it. And then the user manager can manage user roles for the agency grants. Um, the agency can have one user manager, they can have 10 user managers, um, <clears throat> but every agency should have one. And um, this option or this role may be requested on the form, which I believe we go over on the next slide. Oh, no, we do not. Um, please note every agency must register two users in order to complete the application. This doesn't mean that both users have to actively be working on uh, the the application, but the main summary does in does require three different contacts, two of which cannot be the same. So you can have two um, people in one or you know two roles, and then the third person in the third role, or some combination of that. 
um, you, you can have more users registered that are not necessarily grant contacts. Um, and that will make much more sense once you're actually in the application and able to see um, you know, what information we're requiring. Next slide. And again, every agency should have an agency user manager. Um, again, they re approve requests to maintain existing security for users already established. And there is a user guide um, for user managers, which again, the link here is on, um, on the screen. Next slide. And that wraps that up. Um, if you have, you know, any information we do have or need any, any additional information or have any questions, we do have the eGrants Help Desk, which is available for you Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. Um, we also have the resource account, which has been listed on a few of the slides if you'd like to email your questions in. Um, but that does wrap it up, and I will turn things over to Chris for some additional information. Thanks, Anna. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, in, in order to eventually receive grant payments from PCCD, your agency must be registered as a vendor in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's vendor system. Uh, if you know your agency is registered in the vendor system and you know your agency's vendor number, um, you don't have to register again and you should be good to go uh, to receive payments from us. Um, if you are unsure, if your agency has a vendor number, or if you know your agency does not have a vendor number, you will want to go to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's vendor registration system webpage, which is linked here on the screen and will be you know, obviously available in the slides. Um, once you navigate to that webpage, uh, you will see links for four different types of vendors. You will want to choose the link labeled non procurement vendor. You also want to have your agency's employer identification number handy as you'll be required to enter that number in the system. Um, after entering your agency's EIN, the system will tell you whether your agency already has a, an assigned vendor number. If there is no vendor number assigned to your agency, you will be presented with a page then to enter your agency's information, such as agency name, address, and contact information so that uh, your organization can be assigned a comparable vendor number. If a vendor number already exists, for the EIN you entered, the system will tell you that and it will ask you to enter your agency's vendor number. If you don't know the vendor number, just reach out, reach out to us um, and we can assist you with that. Um, finally, you should also have your banking information available uh, for the account that you would want grant payments deposited to. You will want to establish your banking details at the time of registration because PCCD will make direct deposits of grant payments via ACH to the bank account associated with your vendor information in the Commonwealth vendor system. Um, again, if you have any questions with us during your, your application process, um, feel free to reach out, out to us. We'd be happy to help you uh, get everything set up correctly. Um, Sam, I think that covers the vendor registration portion and I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thanks so much, Chris, and thanks so much, Heather. Um, so we wanted to provide you in our in our final portion of the presentation um, with a summary of what's included in the VIP eGrants application. Obviously, for many of you, you've already taken steps to um, log into eGrants, find the funny announcement, and take a look at this yourself and start an application. But for those of you who um, maybe aren't registered in eGrants just yet, we wanted to preview um, what the application will entail. And of course, we do strongly encourage you to carefully review uh, the VIP funding announcement that was shared with you all via email on December 1st before beginning your application in eGrants. Um, so just a, a reminder before we dive into the details here uh, that the faster you're able to complete and submit your formal application in eGrants, the sooner that PCCD will be able to finalize awards and, and help you get those projects started. Um, so as you can see on this slide, the, the very first section that's in our eGrants application is the executive summary. Um, so in the funding announcement and in eGrants, you'll see that you're prompted to fill out a script um, and paste the executive summary section using those prompts. So um, you might recall that we asked for a similar type of summary in your initial funding request. Just know that the response you gave to question 15 um, of your SurveyMonkey form can be copied and pasted 
um, from your original application to complete this section. Just double check that what you had provided initially matches up with that script. Um, the next area is a really important one. It's our budget detail. Um, and this budget detail section is really designed to identify what the funds will be used for um, and line items that should be entered for each budgeted cost. So um, in this section, we're looking for um, clear calculations um, around kind of how much uh, unit items cost um, and then some justifications around um, why those costs are necessary for the project's activities. Um, and again, this should be consistent with the expenses um, and activities that your organization included in its initial funding request form that was submitted via SurveyMonkey. Um, and we certainly encourage folks to check out that budget detail walkthrough um, resource that's available on PCCD's website. I did provide a link um, to where that lives um, in case you wanna check that resource out. And again, we'll, we'll share more information following today's session. Um, so that's the budget side. Um, obviously, if you have any questions about how to navigate any of that, please don't hesitate to reach out. Our, our fiscal team would be more than happy to help you kind of figure out what should live where. Um, on the project narrative side, uh, there's a couple of sections in this one that we wanted to highlight. So one is around project goals and expected outcomes. So this description should provide an overview of your projects, uh, the overall goal of the project, and measurable achievements that you expect to be accomplished with the funded activity. Um, you should describe essentially in this section what will change or be different as a result of your project's activities in the short, mid, and longer term. Um, we also ask you to provide some information about project location or locations, um, so identifying where project activities primarily will take place, and we ask you to be as specific as possible there, so if it's in a certain neighborhood or zip code, etc., um, let us know in that section. Uh, you'll also be asked to provide some information on target populations and referral processes. Again, um, you were asked to provide some of this information in the initial funding request, so just elaborating a little bit further on that in your formal application. Um, and we're really looking there for the specific methods um, that will be used to make the service or the project available to potential participants. Um, and then obviously any additional referral processes that take place uh, beyond that. Um, the next portion of, of the project narrative is around project implementation planning. So this asks you to identify um, the steps that you'll take to implement the project following award. Um, and we ask you to really uh, describe the specific activities, the time frame for those activities, um, as well as the, the individual or individuals who are responsible for the activity for the full length of the project. So, um, you know, we sort of provide an example of that in our e-grants system, as well as in the funding announcement. Um, asking you to kind of break down the, the full project period into a first three months, three to six months, um, six to 12 months, et cetera. Um, you should be sure that key individuals, whether that's staff, consultants, contractors, project partners, volunteers, et cetera, um, anyone who's involved in those activities, um, just making sure that those responsibilities are clearly described. Um, and just, you know, being sure to delineate kind of who's doing what and when um, will be really helpful for our team. Um, the next section after project narrative um, is performance measures. So uh, the pro proposed projects that are supported with VIP funds uh, must be able to report out on pre-selected performance measures. Um, and projects need to be able to report quarterly on those established performance measures uh, via the e-grant system. Um, so those performance measures, and again, those are uh, also available and described in both the funding announcement and in e-grants, uh, include the following. It would be the total number of individuals served, reached, or engaged by the program during the reporting period, the number of new individuals that are served, reached, or engaged by the program, uh, the number of individuals that are served by demographic information, if that is available, uh, the number of participants successfully completing the program, uh, successfully completing is really uh, defined by uh, your specific program and kind of what those parameters would be. Um, we're looking for grantees to also report on the number of trainings that are conducted for or with uh, community and or stakeholder groups, um, as well as the number of uh, memoranda of understanding or formal agreements that are established with project partners 
um, if applicable. And then finally, um, we are also asking grantees to report out on the number of meetings and events with community members, stakeholders, or other partners during uh, the reporting period. Um, so again, uh, those are all referenced in the funding announcement. Um, if you have any questions about those measures, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, beyond what's included in e-grants and in that funding announcement, we are also planning to assign additional performance measures that are model and program specific uh, that will be assigned to your grant project in e-grants following the initial application submission. Um, so we'll be in touch with those award recipients um, may also want to develop their own uh, performance measures above and beyond what PCCD is requiring um, that are specifically related to your uh, project activities. Um, and you're certainly encouraged uh, to, to do so and track those and report those um, through the e-grant system um, or reach out to us and we can talk about additional ways that you can track that and report that um, through, your, through your quarterly reporting. Um, and then the last two sections in e-grants um, are not necessarily universally applicable, but if you are a nonprofit organization, um, you do need to make sure that you complete the nonprofit agency checklist portion um, of e-grants. So um, if that applies to you, just know that you will need to provide the following items um, you know, in e-grants uh, when you complete your application. So that includes a copy of the most recent audited financial report, um, a copy of your most recently submitted Form 990, um, a list of the members of the Board of Directors, a copy of Articles of Incorporation, a copy of bylaws for the organization, um, your IRS determination uh, letter, a copy of me meeting minutes for board meetings, um, and then evidence that the project director, financial officer, and board officers, and any employee responsible for the receipt of funds um, have uh, are included in an employee dishonesty insurance policy, um, and, and just making sure that we have those pieces checked off. Um, and then last but not least, a written statement um, around some, some checking account procedures and, and some controls on that front. Um, and then finally, um, for all of our applicants, you will be required to submit a signature page. Um, so that's sort of the, the kind of content of the application um, from start to finish. And again, more information about all of that is included in the funding announcement and definitely encourage folks to uh, review that carefully before you go in and get started. Uh, I'm going to pause there and see if um, Chris has any additional comments or suggestions for folks, um, particularly around the, the nonprofit agency checklist, the signature page, or certainly the budget detail section. Uh, no, I, I, I don't have anything right now, Sam. I think you covered it. Um, Again, just to reiterate, you know, there, there are tools available to help you through this. Um, we have the walkthroughs for the budget detail and certainly, um, you know, we're, we're more than happy to, to help you through this process. Um, you know, if, if you're unsure uh, what we're asking at any point, you know, in the application process, just reach out to you. You'll notice once you start your application, that you have assigned contacts, a program and a fiscal contact. Um, just reach out to those folks and they'll be more than happy to help you. Thanks, Sam. Great, thanks so much, Chris. All right, so moving right along, um, we wanted to just provide a quick uh, overview of some action steps that your organization should take uh, if you haven't done so already. Um, so first and foremost, as Chris mentioned earlier, make sure that your organization is registered with the Commonwealth as a vendor. Um, you should also take steps to register in eGrants if you aren't already uh, registered so that you're ready to begin building and submitting your formal application. Um, and then again, just make sure you keep an eye out for an email from our staff regarding scheduling an onboarding call with program and fiscal staff, as well as emails um, really about um, any other sort of questions that our team may have um, or reminders as we're going through the application phase. And then I mentioned at the top that, that we would cover some quote unquote homework. Um, so we recognize again that for some of you, you might need to take steps uh, before you can actually fully get started in eGrants. So while you're 
uh, taking those steps, you can certainly begin developing a budget detail and project narrative um, outside of the e-grant system that you could eventually uh, pull in there. So we encourage you to kind of um, start thinking about that, start forming that language. Um, and again, just as a reminder, um, you must develop that budget and that project narrative based on what your organization originally proposed in your initial request. Um, we've already gotten some, some questions from folks. Um, hey, can I get a copy of my initial funding request just to um, make sure that I'm working off of the right thing? Absolutely, just send an email to our team and we can um, be sure to get you um, the right materials um, if, you, if you need those. Um, we also encourage you to review the performance indicators that are mentioned in that funding announcement, and then obviously the performance indicators will follow up with um, that are more program and project specific. Um, encourage you to think about, if you haven't already, other potential data that you might want to track to measure the program uh, success and progress. Um, and then certainly, again, encourage you to respond to any requests for additional information from PCCD staff. The more responsive you are, um, the quicker we can uh, kind of move things along and, and get these finalized. Um, wanted to just again recap, um, we've already talked about how your budget should look um, similar to what you proposed in your initial funding request. Just a reminder of some of the activities and expenses that can uh, and cannot be supported with VIP grant funding. Um, so starting on the what can be supported, um, you'll see on this slide that that includes um, you know, funding can be supporting expenses that are associated with direct project activities and implementation, uh, such as salaries and benefits for personnel, uh, contractors and consultants, facilitating referrals uh, that can include incentives or stipends for participants, as an example, uh, supplies and equipment, training, technical assistance for program or model implementation, uh, for instance, training staff uh, in a given approach, maybe establishing data collection and reporting protocols, um, and or related business and administrative functions, uh, travel and transportation expenses, including vehicle leases, um, indirect costs are allowable up to 10% of the total project budget, um, and again, any other activities necessary to meet the needs of uh, the program and participants. And again, um, we say it every couple of slides, but we do reserve the right to have approved applicants remove or reduce items from the proposed budget that um, are either deemed ineligible or not sufficiently related to the project. Um, and we do have approval of all final budgets. So that's the what you can spend money on, uh, globally speaking. Um, this slide shows what activities and expenses cannot be supported with grant funding under the VIP program. Um, so generally speaking, funding under uh, VIP cannot support activities associated um, with physical security and infrastructure costs, such as security cameras or building modifications or other hardening strategies. Um, it also cannot support indirect costs that exceed 10% of the total project budget. Um, and just to note that, you know, our team is certainly happy to, you know, answer any questions you might have about those calculations or how to figure out what's indirect versus not indirect. Um, we'll also make some judgment calls uh, in the review of applications if it seems like some expenses, um, you know, actually should be falling in the indirect category. Um, so again, those budget details, the more specific you can be about how that expense fits into the direct project activities, um, the easier it makes our lives in terms of figuring out whether that's truly a direct expense versus something that is indirect. Um, you can also see uh, rounding out the list, construction, land acquisition, lobbying and political contributions, vehicle purchases, um, and honoraria or bonuses are also not permitted um, under this funding stream. Um, and again, we'll take a look at budgets and certainly reach out if there's any questions or concerns. Uh, and likewise, you know, if you have any questions or need clarification regarding any of the allowable or unallowable expenses or anything else, uh, how to capture your proposed activities in the budget detail section, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Chris mentioned that um, in eGrants, you'll see there's a fiscal staff that's assigned to your grant. Um, they're a great resource and can certainly walk you through uh, requirements and help you navigate that process. So we encourage you to, to raise your hand if you have any questions while you're going through that. Um, so a few uh, reminders before we head into our Q&A section. Um, so again, the eGrants application window opened December 1st. It'll close December 22nd. 
you need to be registered in eGrants to access and submit an application. Uh, an invitation to submit an application in eGrants does not guarantee a project will be funded. Um, awards are not final until receipt of a formal award letter from PCCD. Uh, applications will be reviewed on a rolling basis, so that means the sooner you submit uh, and the sooner you respond to any fiscal or program concerns, the quicker that we can process and make final award determinations. Um, PCCD is not liable for any costs that are incurred prior uh, to the official start date of the award and having that award letter in hand. Um, and organizations may only request reimbursement for expenditures that are approved in their final budgets. Um, and again, as we mentioned before, just a quick note, you will get lots and lots of notifications through eGrants um, and in your emails. Uh, so you should just be sure to check for those and uh, be responsive to any incoming requests. So with that, um, I see we already have a couple uh, Q&A questions submitted. Um, I am going to turn things over to my colleague Alyssa, um, who will be facilitating um, sort of the Q&A portion of, of this webinar. Um, if you do have any more questions, obviously, please feel free to submit those in the Q&A function so we can get to as many as possible. So Alyssa, I will turn things over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, so we've gotten some pretty good questions so far, um, so I'll go through those. Um, and if you have any more, obviously put them in there. Um, so I think, um, you know, Sam, this one might be for you. Are we allowed to publish this award on media yet? Yeah, that is a great question. So in terms of media, it's certainly fine to respond to inquiries. Um, and if you want to, you know, holding events uh, is, is certainly uh, under your discretion. We just wanted to, to encourage folks to proceed with caution just because um, if unless you officially have your award letter in hand, um, nothing's 100 percent finalized. So we're just letting folks know um, your projects certainly have have met the initial round of approval. They've obviously been announced. Uh, by the governor's office and other uh, public officials. Um, so we're certainly excited to kind of, you know, take you guys to, to the next stage um, in terms of the funding process, but nothing is absolutely guaranteed until the award letter is fully in hand. Um, so long story short, uh, feel free to respond to media inquiries. Just, you know, uh, maybe be a little bit cautious um, in terms of kind of um, going too far too fast before the awards are in hand. Awesome, great. I know a couple people asked that one, so I'm sure that's helpful. Um, are they um, able to upload letters of support? Yes, so there is an attachment um, feature in eGrants where you can upload additional information, whether it's letters of support or any other kind of documents that you think would be helpful for making your case. All right, great. Um, Chris, this question's more for you. Um, would you mind going over re the reimbursement method a little bit more? Um, a couple people said that was a little confusing, um, so they wanted more information. Sure. Um, so PCC typically pays, pays grants on a uh, reimbursement basis. And what that means is uh, once you, your award, you have your award officially in place, um, you'll be required to, I think Sam mentioned during the presentation to submit quarterly financial and program reports. Um, so you'll basically tell us in your financial report how much was expended for that quarter, and then we'll generate a payment um, for that amount to pay your organization. Um, now quarterly is, it, reports are required quarterly. You can submit reports more frequently um, if there are, you know, if your organization would not be able to support a whole quarter's worth of expenditures before being uh, reimbursed. Um, so you can report monthly if you would like, um, e even more frequently than that. There's no limit to how often you could submit a report so that we could reimburse your organization. Um, and I think as Sam mentioned, if there are large purchases, uh, for for example, for equipment, um, you know, we can work with your organization to uh, possibly, you know, pay that money up front so that you can make that large purchase um, in a timely manner. Um, if you have other questions, you know, uh, about that process, you know, certainly feel free to reach out to us. Awesome. And and once they get into that process, are they able to make budget modifications? Yes. Yeah. Um, there is a possibility to make project mod submit a project modification request where you could adjust your budget to reflect um, either actual expenditures um, or 
add items to the budget that you may not have realized that, that you would have uh, uh, that were necessary for your project. And of course, that would uh, eventually be reviewed by PCD program and fiscal staff and have to be improved. OK, um, and we have a couple more budget questions. Um, so would program utilities, phone, Internet and program insurance be considered indirect costs or program costs? Um, typically, those will be considered more indirect uh, indirect costs. OK, um, and would you mind explaining the difference between an honorarium and a stipend? Um, well, basically, I, I would say uh, for your project, we, we if you have honorarium or stipends, um, you know that that was one of the ineligible costs. So I'm not sure. Um, I guess what the question is, maybe if that person can um, ask us offline, we can go over that in more detail with them. Okay. Uh, what yeah. They want to do. I was just going to say, and just just generally speaking, I certainly echo what Chris said. Um, you know, it would probably be easier if that individual emails us, and we can kind of provide project specific input. Um, but globally speaking, I think the difference between honoraria um, and, and stipends, um, it's, it's really at the participant level. So we allowed for incentives and stipends really around the facilitation of services and supports for um, program participants. Um, honoraria and bonuses are, are typically um, going to be things that are um, speaker fees, things that are kind of more at kind of a, a high level um, bonus, so to speak. So with stipends, we're really looking to support expenses that, again, are helping participants um, sort of get what they need, uh, remain in the program, those types of expenses, as opposed to, um, you know, conference fees and those types of things. Again, not automatically that conference fees aren't allowable, just, you know, that's generally the distinction, at least in my mind. OK, great. Um, so another individual asked in the announcement of organizations receiving a first round of funding, um, were the amounts listed for one year or two years? That is a great question. So the amount listed is for the total project period, which would be two years. So that is the max that your organization can request and utilize over the full project period. OK, um, and how long does it take to receive a reimbursement after that request? It, it can take up to 30 days from the time we initiate the payment. OK, great. Um, are you able to upload a video with the application? Oh, geez, I don't know, <laughs> Heather or Chris. I don't know if we've ever gotten that before. Um, I'm assuming there might be file size limitations, but do you guys know? Yeah, there are, and I'll, I'll defer to Heather too, but uh, there are file size limitations, so I, my, I do not believe you'd be able to upload a video. I'll just chime in. I honestly do not know. <laughs> well, I would say too, um, you know, if you have a link to a video as opposed to uploading a file, um, you could certainly, I think, include that within your project narrative or elsewhere. OK, great. Um, so Heather, I have another question for you. Um, can you go over how we register uh, an agency or a nonprofit on eGrants and how does that differ from registering the users? Absolutely. So registering your agency does. Um, if you look at the when you look at the form, it, it is asking for information such as are you a nonprofit, a DUNS number, your agency, um, contact information. So there is some information that is pertaining specifically to your agency. So once the agency is registered, and Chris, if you'd want to jump in because I I'm, I know that has to do with you know the whole fiscal end of things, um, it all ties together. You know your your agency is who is applying for the grant. The the user contacts are the people that are going in to work on the grant. So that's why there's two, you know, there's the agency registration and the user registration. Again, Chris, if you want to add anything to that as far as, you know, the differences there. No, I I, I think you got it. Yeah, you know, we like like you said, the agency we have to have the agency's uh, information in our system like, you know, address, EIN number, and then we also have to have 
um, the users that will have security to that agency so that they are able to create um, you know, the application content and submit the application eventually. Thank you. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Um, in relation to that, so a system for a man award management um, registration, do you need the registration for the number or do you have to go through a more detailed registration? No, we, we do not need any uh, SAM registration information for this uh, opportunity. All right, great. We have a couple more that just came in. Um, can you speak to what's actually expected of agencies at this point in the process? With the public announcement of the awards, we thought the process was more procedural at this point, but it sounds like we're still trying to demonstrate the value of our proposals in this part of the process. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. Um, the initial round of applications were submitted in obviously in SurveyMonkey, um, and then um, organization your your agencies were selected um, to submit a formal application in eGrants. So we think you know the 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 idea or your proposal was accepted and and approved uh, for you to submit an application in eGrants. So um, what we're looking for now is your official application that we can make a grant contract out of. Um, and we're looking for you to put your idea into a more formal proposal in eGrants um, so that we can vet some of those, uh, some of the costs um, that weren't as specific in the SurveyMonkey application that those will need to be more specific in our eGrants application. Same with the program information. Um, so we just want to make sure that the costs that you are now putting, um, you know, the costs and the activities align with your initial proposal and that they are all out. OK, great. Um, also, just um, for a note, uh, it does appear that Sam is having technical issues. Um, so if you can't see anything on the screen right now, um, that's why. Um, but we are here and we are still going to answer your questions. Um, so we have a couple more questions. Um, I know we talked a little bit about changing the budget. Um, but somebody uh, wanted to clarify, um, can you change the budget up from what was in Survey Monkey budget? Um, as a po and uh, as long as you don't change the total amount. Yeah, you you would have, obviously you cannot apply for more than what was requested in the survey monkey application. And again, I'll just reiterate what I said with the last question that we're looking for um, your formal application and e-grants to match kind of what you propose with your initial application. So the cost, uh, and we understand that they not may not be identical, but we're looking for the cost to. Uh, that you submit in your eager as application to support what you initially proposed in your survey monkey application. And I think Sam's back, so I'll let her add to that if she if she um, you know, has anything to add to that. No, nothing to add, just hopefully you guys can still hear me. I apologize for the technical difficulties, um, but glad, glad we're still able to hear uh, things. So <laughs> thanks for carrying forward, Alyssa. No problem. Um, so at this time, oh, we have one more. Um, so the eGrants application asks for Senate and House districts for the application. Should they use the area where most activity will take place or the organization's address or our PO box? What should we use to determine that? Yeah, I would recommend using uh, the area where the activities will take place. Um, as your kind of primary geography area. I know for some projects that might be multiple counties, multiple areas. So again, if you have any questions, I encourage you to reach out and we can kind of triage from there. Okay, great. Um, so unless anybody else has any other questions, I think we have uh, hit all of the questions. If not, obviously you can reach out to us um, and we can answer more questions, but I think that's it from my end. All right, thanks so much, Alyssa. Um, so there was only one more slide to go, um, and it was really around additional resources and assistance. So again, our thanks to all of you um, for participating today. We will follow up with a link to the recording of today's session as well as to the slide deck um, so you can take a look at that information more closely. Um, encourage you to reach out to our eGrants system help desk. 
um, you know, by either email or phone. Um, if you do have any uh, project-specific questions or, or things that don't fall into the eGrants category, obviously feel free to email our staff. You can reach us at ra-pccd underscore executive ofc at pa.gov. Um, again, more information about communications protocols will be sent out to you uh, later. Um, and we will still be providing um, updates on our gun violence webpage and, and sending information out um, as we move forward in that process. So again, um, our thanks to each of you for your attention and your participation. Um, if you do have any questions or need anything from us, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and we hope you have a good rest of the afternoon. And we look forward to working with each of you um, on this process and supporting your projects moving forward. So thanks again and have a good rest of the day.